Namaskar my dear students. Today in the preclinical prosthesis section, we will be discussing the anatomical landmarks of the mandible. We will learn them to locate on the model in the impression and also correlate with the oral cavity. We will also discuss their muscle attachments, their importance and role as a danger bearing area. So let's begin. Now let's locate them first. This is the oral cavity mandibular arch. We make the impression. This is the impression which is the negative replica. We pour it with some gypsum product to get a positive replica that is the model. Okay, we paint them uh, in our preclinical exercise to understand the landmarks. So I have a painted cast here. Starting interiorly, this is the labial frenum. We get a labial notch in the impression. And here is the labial frenum. We can see the blue color in the model. Then on both the sides of the labial frenum, there is labial vestibule. Okay, we get labial flange on both the sides. And this red color part you can see, this is the labial vestibule. Then comes the buccal frenum. Okay, this is the buccal notch that we obtain in the impression. And here is the buccal frenum in the model. This is the buccal vestibule posterior to the buccal uh, frenum. This is the buccal flange that we get and here is the buccal vestibule in the model. Coming on the lingual side, this is the lingual frenum, the attachment of the lingual frenum just uh, behind the labial frenum. Here is the lingual notch that we get and here is the lingual frenum in the model. On the both sides of the lingual frenum, there is alveololingual sulcus. Okay, this is the alveololingual sulcus. Okay, we get alveololingual flange here. Lingual flange we call, this is uh, normally S shape. Okay, we will learn the details of this flange later. This is the uh, flange that we get and this is the lingual vestibule. We can see it has been divided into three parts. So we will discuss this alveololingual sulcus. It has three parts. Uh, in the video. Now, this is the retromolar pad which helps in retention. Okay, this is the fossa that we get in the impression. Okay, here is the retromolar pad which has been marked on both the sides. And this blue color you can see, this is the buccal shelf area. It is the primary stress bearing area. We will discuss it later. This is the buccal shelf area on both the sides. So this is how we locate the landmarks in the oral cavity, in the impression and in the model. Three things you should know about the, any landmark. First is its location. Second is its anatomy, the muscle attachment and third is its function. So let us understand the maxillary anatomical landmarks under three headings, the limiting areas, supporting areas and the relief areas. Let us start with the limiting areas first. The limiting or the peripheral areas, they determine the denture borders, mainly the extension of the denture. Okay, anteriorly if we start, this is the labial frenum. It is recorded as a labial notch in the impression and here is the labial frenum as we just discussed earlier. On both sides of the labial frenum, there is a labial vestibule between the labial frenum and the buccal frenum. It comes as a labial flange in the impression and here is the labial vestibule. Then comes posteriorly if we move buccal frenum. This is the buccal notch in the impression and here is the buccal frenum attachment in the cast. Moving posteriorly, here is the buccal vestibule posteriorly both sides. It is recorded as buccal flange on both the sides and here is the buccal vestibule in the model. Coming to the lingual side, this is the lingual frenum. On the lingual side, it comes as a lingual notch, recorded as lingual notch in the impression. And here is the lingual frenum in the model. Then comes the alveololingual sulcus. On both the sides of the lingual frenum, this is recorded as lingual flange in the impression. And here is the alveololingual sulcus in the model. On the posteriorly, there is a pear shaped pad, which is called as a retromolar pad. Okay, it is recorded as retromolar fossa in the impression and here is the marked retromolar pad in the cast. Okay, now there is an attachment of pterygomandibular raphae on the distal most side. We will uh, discuss this in detail. 
it is recorded as notch on the distal part of the impression it should be relieved while we are making the denture uh, on the distal part of the mandibular ridge now first is the labial frenum it is a band of fibrous connective tissue on the labial aspect of the residual ridge to the lip we can see in the picture it is appears as a notch in the impression uh, called as the labial notch and we can locate it on the cast also the muscle attachment orbicularis oris muscle it mainly influences this frenum it is very sensitive and active frenum unlike the maxillary labial frenum and it should be nicely relieved in the denture second is the labial vestibule you know it is divided into right and left side by the labial frenum it it extends till the buccal frenum as we can see in the picture it is uh, it is recorded as labial flange in the impression we can locate the labial vestibule on the model also it is mainly covered by non keratinized lining mucosa the muscle attachment is mentalis and orbicularis oris which influences it the mandibular dentures and the impression they are recorded as narrowest in this region this is one of the viva question which is asked going posteriorly next is the buccal frenum it is a fibrous band that separates the labial and the buccal vestibule as we can see in the picture uh, it is recorded as the buccal notch in the impression and we can locate the buccal frenum on the cast also then coming to the muscle attachment the pressor anguli oris muscle it mainly influences this area the danger has to be relieved in this area otherwise it will just lift up with slight movement moving posteriorly is the next is the buccal vestibule it mainly extends from the buccal frenum to the mm. retromolar pad it is recorded as buccal flange in the impression and uh, it is we can locate the buccal vestibule in the cast also muscle attachment mainly the buccinators influence this area the distobuccal border it forms the distobuccal border which is mainly influenced by the masseter and the buccinator two muscles the fiber of the masseter they run outside and behind the buccinator as we can see in the picture so when the patient is asked to open the mouth against resistance the masseter it contracts and it pushes against the buccinator and it produces a bulge in the mouth this produces the masseteric notch in the impression and dentures you know this is one of the favorite viva questions which is asked and sometimes we get confused in, with the muscles so always remember masseter applies pressure on the buccinator okay the various factors that influence this area are first is the diameter of the masseter muscle smaller the diameter it will have less influence second is the path of the muscle fibers from the zygomatic arch to the ramus so more medial the path it will have more influence angle of the ramus if it is perpendicular then it will have more influence on in this area now coming on the lingual side we have the lingual frenum it is a mucus band of fold that attaches the tongue it is an active frenum we can see in the uh, picture the lingual frenum then it is recorded as lingual notch in the impression and we can locate it on the cast also the relief should be provided in this area if we are not giving a relief it may cause soreness and dislodgement of the denture now on both sides of the lingual frenum there is alveololingual sulcus we can locate it on the oral in the oral cavity it is recorded as lingual flange in the impression the typical s shape we were talking about it can also be marked on the cast or the model this alveolar lingual sulcus has three parts first is the interior region it extends from the lingual frenum to where the mylohyde ridge curves okay this depression is called as the premylohyde fossa and it is obtained as premylohyde prominence or eminence in the impression okay now this lingual flange area will be shorter than as compared to the posteriorly okay second is the middle region it extends from the premylohyde fossa to the distal end of the mylohyde ridge okay the lingual flange it moves medially towards the uh, tongue because of the prominence of the mylohyde ridge 
okay this area helps in stabilization of the denture as tongue will rest here and also helps to maintain the seal of the denture then comes third is the posterior region it extends from the distal end of the mylohyoid ridge to the retromyelohyoid curtain the lingual flange it turns into the retromyelohyoid fossa and it completes the typical s form of the lingual flange as we can see in the picture now this area posterior region is now no more affected by the mylohyoid muscle now going posteriorly is the retromolar pad as we can see in the picture this is the retromolar pad it is obtained as retromolar fossa in the impression and the blue color part in the cast is the retromolar pad it is a triangular soft pad of tissue which helps in retention of the denture okay now its mucosa is composed of thin non keratinized epithelium and in addition to loose alveolar tissue its submucosa contains glandular tissue fibers of buccinator and superior constrictor muscles the pterygomandibular raphe and the terminal part of the tendons of temporalis you know these muscles they limit the extension of the denture distally as there are a lot of structures in the retromolar pad and this is a very common question which is asked by the examiner so i have a mnemonic for you the new location of garden bothered students parents and the teachers it goes like t thin n non keratinized epithelium l loose alveolar tissue g glandular tissue b buccinator s superior constrictor p pterygomandibular raphe and t is the temporalis muscle now what is the importance of this retromolar pad the denture base should extend at least one half to two third of this pad uh, for, to gain the re uh, retention now the next and the last very important limiting structure is the pterygomandibular raphe its extension it arises from the hamular process of the medial pterygoid plate and attaches to the mylohyoid ridge okay now the muscle attachment the superior constrictor it inserts posterior medially and buccinator anterior laterally in it we can see in the picture also it, it it is visually and digitally palpated in the overall cavity okay and it is recorded as a notch in the impression just on the distal most part it is recorded as a net notch when we ask the patient to wide open the mouth and it should be relieved in the dentures now after the limiting areas let us discuss the supporting areas the supporting areas can be the primary stress bearing areas and the secondary stress bearing areas in the primary stress bearing area we have the buccal shelf area in the secondary stress bearing areas we have the alveolar ridge now next is the buccal shelf area the primary supporting area it is the area between the mandibular buccal frenum and the interior edge of the masseter muscle we can see the shaded part in the oral cavity the in the picture its boundaries are often asked by the examiner it is bounded interiorly by the crest of the residual ridge laterally by the external oblique ridge and distally by the retromolar pad it widens with the alveolar resorption we can see the blue colored part in the cast as the buccal shelf area why it is considered as the primary stress bearing area for the denture first the bone is covered by a layer of cortical bone you know it the cortical bone is present and second it lies perpendicular to the vertical occlusal forces so this is again a very frequent question asked by the examiner the second supporting area is the alveolar ridge it is favorable for the support of the denture but in secondary manner you know the mucous membrane of the alveolar ridge it is covered by keratinized layer and it and it is attached by its submucosa to the periosteum we can see the alveolar ridge in the oral cavity it is obtained as alveolar groove in the impression and whole of the green part we can see this is the alveolar ridge marked in the cast the underlying bone in the alveolar ridge is often cancellous so that is why it offers the secondary support and this also depends on the form of the alveolar ridge which is present in the patient now after the supporting areas the last are the relief areas which need to be relieved first is the mylohyoid ridge mental foramen genial tubercle and the torus mandibularis 
Let us discuss them one by one. The first relief area is the malohydrate. If we talk about its extension, we can see in the picture that anteriorly the ridge lies close to the inferior border of the mandible and posteriorly it flushes with the crest of the residual ridge after resorption. Now, why it is considered as a relief area? Because the overlying mucous membrane is very thin in this region, which can be easily traumatized by the danger base. So, it should be relieved to avoid any kind of soreness. One more important thing, you know, the malohyde muscle is attached to this malohyde ridge, okay, and it forms the floor of the mouth. So the denture extends beyond the malohyde ridge, uh, but it should not go under it. The next is the mental foramen. The mental nerves and the blood vessels, they pass through the mental foramen. Okay, after resorption, what happens? The mental foramen, it comes closer to the crest of the residual ridge, as we can see in the picture. So why it is considered as relief? Because the relief will avoid any kind of compression in this area, which may otherwise lead to numbness of the lower limb. The next are the genial tubercles. They are the spiny prominences of the bone located on the lingual aspect of the mandible. You know, these structures, they serve as attachment for the genioclossus and the genio-hired muscles. After resorption, what happens? These two barkers, they come to lie closer to the crest of the ridge. Okay, and they can be palpated in the oral cavity also. Now, why they should be relieved? Because the overlying mucosa is very thin over these tubercles and they may get traumatized if not relieved. The next are the torus mandibularis. It is a bony enlargement most commonly found bilaterally in the premolar region between the floor of the mouth and the crest of the ridge. We can see in the picture both sides the tori are visible. Now why they should be relieved? It is covered by extremely thin layer of mucous membrane. So either it should be surgically removed if it in interferes with the border seal of the denture or it should be relieved to prevent any kind of soreness. So with this, I conclude, I'm sure you will be able to locate and correlate clinically all the mandibular landmarks. You can give your feedback and topics in the comments box. Do not forget to like and share the video with your friends and your juniors. Wish you success.